right. So, okay, uh, everybody, I think we're going to get started here. Um, a little bit later, but we can be efficient in our discussion. Um, I have been handed an open doors key to room 714 in the Hilton. So uh, if anybody dropped their room key, otherwise if anybody else is staying in the Hilton, you can use this and charge your dinner and stuff like that. So <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll have it right up here uh, at the, de um, at the uh, stage here. So uh, the next session uh, we're having is an open discussion on requirements, how to uh, define and identify, how should we prioritize, etc. So we have uh, Hendrick as the uh, chair, but um, by no means will he dominate the conversation because we want everybody to participate and say something. <laughs> I brought my own microphone. Oh, you did? Okay, very good. Okay. So uh, I guess maybe Jeff will help me uh, monitor the uh, microphones for... Uh, so let me, uh, let me do a few things to uh, start it off. It was the Committee for Analyze, Analysis and Forecast Technique Implementations. That was CAFTI. Um, and yeah, whatever you put on the internet stays there because I just found the agenda of the last 2002 CAFTI meeting on the internet. It's still there. Uh, probably maintained by somebody who does not know how to maintain absolutely 100% dead websites, but okay. So at that point, up to 2002, there was actually a central committee at the central, at headquarters, that decided what went into operations. Then we have uh, another four letter word, uh, OSIP. Uh, OSIP looked like uh, gonna be a replacement of CAFT, but then uh, Steve and others managed to uh, get the EMC a full exemption of OSIP, so we always enjoyed OSIP. We only did OSIP when it was beneficial to us, and otherwise we completely ignored it, which means that we've done about three or four OSIP projects in all the years that OSIP was there. Uh, now we have CARDS. Uh, well, where is CARDS going to go? Uh, I think uh, CARDS could be very interesting, but uh, Andy Stern gave a presentation to uh, a lot of us about uh, two weeks ago on where CARDS is going. From my perspective, uh, I really like where he's going, but I also was very disappointed because CARDS was completely AFS focused with, oh, well, we talked to the SUS to get STI involved a little bit too. And so that to me, to me that means that uh, no matter what kind of uh, good intentions there are with CARDS, I don't see an intention to make CARDS work for the modeling suite. And so perhaps that changes, perhaps that is intended, I don't know, but if EMC is not involved with cards on an early level, then that process is not going to work for me. So, then we have the White House telling us to do week three and four. We have the National Weather Service strategic plan focusing on IDSS, high impact weather, weather radiation, what kind of impact does it have on me? So, on the one side, uh, we have had a history of looking at modeling as, okay, we model as we know it, uh, how the modeling world works, how do we do that? But the, the, the problem with getting requirements is that where do you get the requirements from? Uh, how do you deal with uh, uh, political and uh, high-level strategic requirements? How do you uh, uh, <coughs> balance these with uh, the field? Uh, all these kind of things. And as a... Um, this meeting has now, this is the 21st time we hold this meeting. It really started out as a meeting intended to just do the show and tell that we started off with uh, in the beginning. It has evolved into a vacuum filling requirements style meeting also, at least a little bit. And so um, I really don't know what the answer is and I'm really therefore uh, as a, a and he will probably ask me, what do you want to get out of this? I want, I'm, I'm at a loss into, uh, in some ways where to go here. Because on the one side, you have these high-level drivers, and on top of that, you have things like uh, uh, EOA, Earth Observing Assessment, done at the government level, uh, NOCIA done at the TIPIO level at the headquarters, and uh, Dave Helms is here. He's, uh, he was here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Helms is here uh, being involved with that. Uh, 
at a very different level, they look at return for investment on, uh, on, on what uh, NOAA is doing. And, um, yeah, I really want to, on the one side, I see a vacuum. If a vacuum is staying there, it's going to hurt me, so I'm going to fill it if needed. But uh, what should we do? Where should we go? And uh, what, what do we expect higher up in the weather service to be part of here? And uh, I really don't know. So I, I would really like to hear bits and pieces of that. I'm putting you a little bit on the spot, Bill. Do you want to say anything about the, about the requirements process to begin? Okay, first thing, it's not easy, as you said, right? And we as a weather service are kind of, we've, we've done some of this in the past, but it's, I don't think, been very structured. And when I was at NASA, it was very structured, an engineering agency. And, um, you know, we, we've, we've got to find the middle ground. And one thought is, for example, the, um, there are 11 service programs in the National Weather Service. Okay, and I probably couldn't recite them all, but there are 11. And in a perfect world, one could argue that the service programs, which um, are organizationally located in uh, Analyze Forecast Support Office, which is a headquarters function, <coughs> they have responsibility to the field, including the NSEPs, Water Center, and the regions. And one could argue that the National Service Program leads would be responsible for soliciting, vetting, prioritizing, and validating the requirements for their programs, whether it be observations, computing, uh, modeling, whatever it might be. And so, for example, we had a, um, there was a winter weather program meeting here some months ago. And, the, you know, they had a group of people in the room, and they started talking about requirements. And what they actually were talking about were solutions. They weren't talking about requirements. And so, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit, and one could argue, like, all right, what someone mentioned, we need hourly snowfall rates out to day one or something like that, okay? That's, that's something that they feel they need to predict perhaps in the future. All right, what's the requirement? What do they need from the numerical guidance system or a numerical guidance system, or the or systems, whatever it is, that will enable them to produce that new product. That's the way I'm kind of thinking about it at a very high level. Um, and we could argue, if you start to think about it that way, across the national service programs, you may, you'll start to find there are common requirements across the national service programs that could be solved with a common solution. Because I'll argue severe weather probably has a very similar requirement. There are probably very similar requirements for a numerical guidance system or set of numerical guidance systems for many of the national programs. So that's, that's my initial thought going forward. And I've also seen where I think it was Andy and, and maybe um, Jeff started a bit of a dialogue with requirements for the guidance systems. I, I'm looking at you and you're shaking your head yes. And I don't know if you, if you want to speak to that or if anybody else has something to add on top of what I've already said that has experience with this. Jeff, do you want to add anything? or Not to put you on the spot. But, uh, Steve Lord has something if Jeff doesn't. Uh, well, well, Steve gets the, uh, the microphone. But the one thing that I noticed this week is that we do have this, this, this um, little bit of a tension between what the UMAC is telling us and what the field officer is telling us because, example, um, FAA needs uh, uh, the FAA requirements uh, tell us that we really should run uh, something like the HER out to 36 hours. No, that's a solution. That's not a requirement. That's that that, that, that exact. That's exactly the, the the problem we're running into. What's that? Okay, keep 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 a simpler one up there. Uh, if, if we are getting a, a driver to do week three and four products, uh, and in the meantime we do not see much predictability at all in our uh, uh, guidance products there, how do we deal with that? Well, look, we're running a, a deterministic nine-month forecast four times a day or something like that now. So, you know, let's, let's, let's be real. You know, what was the requirement?
proof of that. So let's keep asking the question. Go ahead, Steve has something. Okay, um, one of my habits is I try to uh, simplify the world, and one way of simplifying the world is to take a job like this and take it to its ab absurd uh, conclusion. Okay, well, the purpose of numerical guidance is to enable forecasters to do their jobs, right? Okay, so imagine a world where we have infinite resources and all our forecasts are perfect. Your requirements are all met. So back off from that and say, well, how close is necessary for you to do your job, okay? which causes you to say, well, okay, I need such and such a forecast out to so many hours so that FAA is satisfied with what we do. So that's just a trivial contribution from an old hand. Eric Baylor at Nesda Star. Um, the issue of requirements is critical, and I, I fully back it. And the issue is the traceability of requirements, because as the, the, observe, or the forecast systems get the requirements from their user base, those requirements then pass through to the observing systems, which then support the forecast. And that's something that we critically need, because that is the basis of your funding. And so. As you do this, it's not just say, I need a forecast out to 24, 24 hours or nine months or whatever the course is. It's who is using it. That's where the requirement is established. I need it for agricultural planting. I need it for safety at sea. I need it for dot, dot, dot. And how much time is needed to do that in order to carry forth whatever things they need to do because they need to plant three months in advance or whatever it is. Those are the requirements. And that then feeds back into, in order to make that, what do I need in order to make that forecast? That then is a derivative requirement for the prediction system, and likewise for the observing system. So in that context, uh, um, with uh, identifying the different forecast ranges, as we did earlier, earlier this week and talked about, um, just mapping, mapping requirements of our users to these forecast ranges would be a good first step. Yeah, this is Jeff Domego. I, I just have one comment, and it's sort of uh, something I interpreted Ken saying yesterday uh, in the discussion in the afternoon, and, and I've heard elsewhere t uh, the last couple of days, which is the, there's a need to change the forecast process in the forecast offices. And, and if we're going to drive our decisions on by products rather than by model specifics, um, to some extent, we need to have some progress, I would hope, in where do we see the forecast, uh, the activity in the forecast office being in a couple of years or in five years, and, and what products, what guidance is needed to support the products we, and, and you know, what seems to be missing, or what I keep thinking is missing, is that there's nothing that says we need to provide ensemble guidance, and yet there's this assumption that we're going to be moving towards a probability-based product list or, or product suite. So there's all of these uncertainties in terms of, and yet there's a certain amount of confidence that this is what we're going to be doing. We're, we're moving our modeling to, entirely towards ensembles for the most part, um, and yet there isn't a product suite to meet with that. So I, I don't know how we get that ball rolling and whether we can make really hard and fast decisions about our, what our next production suite is going to look like in 10 years unless we have that in hand. Uh, we, we're sort of making an assumption that probabilities are going to be what's needed, um, but there's uh, so many other details in between that have to be defined. So, um, In comment, quick comment to what you just mentioned, I fully agree, and that's where we need to start pulling in on NOAA's assets for social science because that's going to help define what is our products we need to be in order to support the user base. So I, I'd like to make a comment here. I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, however, uh, my comment is this, okay. Uh, as far as requirements concerned, I think a lot of discussions to date are service requirements from users' perspective, uh, which is fine, which is very important. However, uh, we've got to be keeping 
keep in mind that the modeling itself is a science, not all engineering. It's not like you make a service requirement that we're going to meet. My favorite uh, example is somebody says, I got a requirement, determinist the forecast six months in advance. Okay, you can make that requirement, but we're not going to meet it because it's just de defying the science. At the same time, however, science itself has to be considered as a another source of requirement. Okay, when your model advances a certain capability you never thought of, in that sense, certainly you, you what you need is you need to validate that that has value before you move into production. Just like when company created some very nice product, you have to test and see if you, if actually if you can sell. If a customer don't buy it, that's no good. Doesn't matter how engineering thinks. In that sense, so, but but so so I think it's a balance is very important. So the requirement has to be coupled both from the field user forecaster whatever side and the matching the science, so that it there, it is it is likely there are another source so that um, you know the say GFS improved to a certain extent and then uh, saying that we can do certain things. And the field needs to validate that it's going to be useful for you. That meeting your your needs that you couldn't that that you couldn't you couldn't meet before that. But it may not have came up from the field to say I I want this thing. I think it's a balance, and we need to keep that in mind. Alan Gerard from uh, NSSO, and I just wanted to follow up on what Jeff was saying. Uh, I just got out to NSSO a few weeks ago, and I, but I'm the main thing I'm going to be working on out there is the Facets project, and and Facets is really moving toward what you know what Jeff is talking about. We're trying to transition the deterministic product suite into a more probabilistic. Uh, calibrated probability uh, product suite, but we're still in a fairly early stage of doing the social science work and the physical science work, and you know how we transition that into operations. So um, we don't have answers yet with that where we can have defined requirements. But I just want to make sure I make the point that that work is started. It is ongoing. Uh, there's a lot of support from both the Weather Service and OAR for this. Work. We have a lot of academic, uh, different labs involved, and um, just want to make sure that we understand that that work is going on, and there is a recognition, I think, at highest levels of NOAA that we want to transition toward more of a probabilistic product suite versus what we have today. Yeah, this is Ken Johnson. Um, first, I want to. Thank Jeff Domego for succinctly uh, summarizing what I said yesterday, probably better than I said it yesterday. Um, the point Ming just made, I think, is important. Uh, the science and the services that versus the services that the field offices need to provide to their customers. Uh, the field knows what they need to provide to their customers. Uh, and they can ask for some things that may not be scientifically possible from the models. And if that request is made, uh, requirement is made, uh, there needs to be that communication back and forth. On the other hand, I can see things coming out of the labs, uh, you know, maybe Stan Benjamin's group or some of the development groups within NSEP here that may come up with something that the field hadn't thought of, and they go to the, you know, and if that can be exposed and presented to the field, they go, whoa, you can do that? Great, we can use that. So I see almost a chicken and egg kind of thing here. And I guess what, what I'm proposing, aside from having some meetings to try to determine what the forecast process is so we can figure out what people are going to be doing in the field so that they can then to try to express their requirements, what I'd like to see maybe this meeting a portion of it evolved towards is this communication between the field and 
EMC, maybe NCEP as a whole, uh, we have a portion of the meeting where we can more or less talk back and forth and try to tease out some of these kinds of requirements and, and become more aware of what the possibilities are and what the possible needs are. It's, uh, I, I think in the past, I, I can think back to some of the early meetings that I went to, the, the early NCEP reviews. It was nice to know what the products were and how well they performed and so forth, but I think we get to a point now where we need to be less separated and more brought together and have these exchanges. Well, you have to be a little careful because even there you're treading on, no, just realize you're treading on the, on, on the edge between what's a requirement and what's solutions because, because uh, some of the things that comes out of the, out of the, uh, the science side are really solutions. Any, anyhow, we, we agree, so let, let's not go the wrong way. <laughs> I just wanted to say something quick. Is I think with the evolving MEG that we have, I think that's one of the ways to engage and uh, it doesn't have to be a one-off every every year where we kind of reassemble and kind of see, okay, where have we gotten? It can be um, maybe the Meg is more like the boots and the boots on the ground kind of thing, but it also is the opportunity to, you know, do this on a more continuous basis. So maybe we're just kind of checking in when we get there. Okay, then we had Jeff and. and yeah, I, I don't disagree to that comment. However, that that is looking to the Meg is looking more to do, to address problems and dealing with the here and now, really? and I'm trying to think more along the lines of where we need to go in the future. But I don't disagree that, yeah. that the MEG process looks like it could help this interaction between modelers in the field, certainly. Sure. So, I mean, you have different levels, so certainly kind of working up in degrees <laughs> of management and so on. Okay, back up. Okay, Jeff. And, okay. Craven, Central Region, and... I want to tie Jeff Tomego, uh thoughts with Alan Gerard. Thought. So, the pro calibrated probabilities of of things that are important to us: QPF, snow, severe weather, all that. We we do need to develop that because, to me, the key to consistency in services throughout our integrated field structure is having calibrated, reliable probabilities. Uh, SPC has shown in many areas that we can generate uh, calibrated, scientifically valid probabilities. The social scientists will tell us and help us eventually figure out how to communicate that so we don't have to worry about saying there's a 31% chance of an inch an hour snowfall. The other thing is that if you can give us that, then the impact, whether there's going to be eight to 10 inches of snow isn't as relevant in, in the future with IDSS. It's is, is how much snow is falling at rush hour. So we'll have other databases scientifically they will say this is rush hour in this city. And so are we going to get inch an hour rates or half an inch hour rates during that period. So I think the infrastructure for probabilities has to be in place for us to then you find ways to utilize them. So I, that also that ties into very short scales or very long scales, but we're not calibrated now in when we issue winter storm watches, when we issue flash flood watches, when we do anything that we do. And I know we're going to argue about what our services will be in the future, whether they're really yes, no, or not. But I, all that has to happen. Now, the thing I struggle with, Bill, is the difference between solutions and requirements because we've always, we've been told many times to come with solutions. Don't, don't complain, come with a solution. So where I'm struggling is I don't know if I completely understand what you need when you say, I need a requirement. So I, I, it's, it's, I'm, a little, I'm still a little confused. Well, along that thread then, you gave an example. 
you have a requirement to predict snowfall rates, rush hour, major metropolitan area. That's, that's a requirement. So then you go to the modeling community and say, all right, here's my requirement. Help find a solution to that requirement. You may have it today already through the HER, for example. But then you refine your requirement. I need it. Do you need it 12 hours in advance, 24, 36, 48? So if you start to ask yourself those kinds of questions based on that requirement, then you start to refine what a solution space looks like. And that's, that's how I think of it in terms of you know, just simplifying it. So you know, in, in this, you know, bring me, don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution. That's... Yeah, we, we, we do want solutions, no, don't get me wrong, but the, the statement about driven by requirements rather than driven by solution, from the complexity view of the production suite is that uh, if you start with giving me a solution, I have to throw something new into my production suite. If you start with looking at the requirement and see if you can find it in the production suite, then you have a chance to keep a very well-organized production suite. So it's not don't give me solutions. It is don't give me a new solution that is disjoint from the production suite that has to go in just for the sake of that solution. That's, that's the difference. I, I, I think that you guys in the field has to be an integrated part of the solution. Okay. There's no means of uh, keeping you from that. What Bill is trying to say is that there are different processes. So we have a, there's a requirement process and there's a solution process. You're involved in both, but make, don't mix them so that don't mix them. Okay. Um, it, was yours quite relevant to this? Or? Yes. Okay. Very irrelevant to this. Of course, of course <laughs> Steve has been waiting. Yeah. Well, not, we keep... <laughs> well, we keep talking about the 11 service areas and all that. I, I think it, we, it's got to be more fundamental than that. It's there's got to be some common thread even amongst all of the service areas so that there's some tool and ways to pull this out. But I, I want to go back to the comment I made when I was up on the stage. You know, interaction is probably the biggest key here because in many ways you don't know what we're doing and we don't know what you're doing to actually create our solutions to our problems. And we're evolving now into this DSS world where, you know, our emergency managers, they don't want words. They want us getting up there and presenting, presenting almost pictures of what we're doing. And a lot of the synthetic stuff and all that, and I'm getting into solutions again here, but, but just the same, we've got to be able to give some kind of a probabilistic means. We've got to be able to properly communicate exactly what you're giving us and know what's behind that. And so this is where I will continually to harp on the fact we need you guys out there with us, and we need to get back here somehow to spend time in – our problematic areas so that we can proper, uh, properly communicate to the folks that we're serving what you're serving us. Um, here's uh, Ken right now. Uh, yeah, I just want to quickly follow up on what Bill said. He, he mentioned 11 service areas, uh, 11 programs, and there's got to be something above that. Uh, I want to maybe ho hopefully clarify something here. We're talking about requirements. We're talking about bringing you requirements, but do we really bring you requirements from the field, or do we bring it to 11 program managers, or do we bring it to somebody that's over the 11 program managers? Uh, I'm not sure how we get started on this, because talk about probabilistic, you know, everybody thinks there's a need for probabilistic. Well, have we validated that? I, I think we probably could pretty easily, but who do we go to? to get this ball started? I don't know. Uh, who, who, who owns the forecast process? I don't know. Is it the council? Is it? Right. So where's the phone number? Who can I call? OK. this should work. And you want to have a point of contact for, for every single one of those programs. And that person is responsible for, again, the requirements process, not just that, but the requirements process across the entire field and what comes from external 
to Weather Service as well. But the point is, you have a point of contact to go provide that information to. And the National Service Program leads are not working on an individual basis. They are working with the regions through the MSDs, the SSDs, the C, whatever Ds there are, and the NSEP service centers, by the way, because they have their own requirements. We are part of the field, exactly. So we are not quite there yet functionally because we have people acting in roles and you know, so Andy Stern is really working hard to fill those positions. I know we just filled the aviation and space weather branch chief. Um, so, you know, we're working hard to get those online, but ideally that's the way it should and could work. All right, we skipped over Steve four times, five times. So, so we'll let Steve say something, and then I'll wander up in the back for the people in the back there, and then you, I know you want to do that one. Yeah, this is okay, the regional folks wanted to test my memory and see if I could remember what I was going to say um, at the particular time. I do want to circle back a little bit um, and follow up a bit on what um, Alan and, and Jeff uh, had indicated for, for Jeff DeMago in terms of do we know if we're going toward probabilistic. Um, at SPC, we've been issuing probabilistic forecasts for 15 years and gradually infusing more probability information into our various products. So for our outlooks, the probabilities map into the categorical, which don't seem like they're going away. So this is an interesting question in terms of what the user community is not one monolithic community. And we have folks that may be comfortable with probabilities, and we have other folks that say, uh, I'm not sure what to do with these. Can you turn these into something more familiar? And this is going to be a big challenge, I think. We're, we're all working with the social science community uh, to try and determine the best ways to move ahead. But I think we understand from a scientific forecasting perspective, we have to account for uncertainty in ways, and certainly the use of probabilities allows us to incorporate that into the process, how we translate that uncertainty that we express with probabilities into ways that some emergency managers may prefer. Uh, this has been the, the part of DSS that's been going on for quite a while now, I think. But I, I don't think uh, we should think that probabilities have not been agreed upon. If you look at the Weather Ready Nation roadmap and how fast it's is, is tied directly into that, the the, the planning is there. There's a lot of effort taking place now to try and figure out how to move ahead. I'll be the first to admit the devil's in the details, and it's going to take a, a lot of trial and error and practice to figure out how to get there. But we need to keep moving in this particular direction, I think. Part of it's going to be our delivery. Um, we've set up an NDFD that is largely deterministic, and that, that makes it difficult to determine how are we going to take this ensemble and probabilistic information and then uh, populate the grids in a way that encourages deterministic thinking as opposed to probabilistic? So there's a key challenge, I think, uh, that, that has to be um, addressed there. Uh, from a requirements process, I know a few years ago, Bill, you had asked the centers, it was probably before uh, one of the, the, the UCAR meetings, where do you envision in a few years, in five years, ten years, thank goodness you stopped at ten, um, what are our products and services liable to look like, if we can imagine? And then what are the attributes of a modeling system that <coughs> might support that, not thinking about any particular models themselves, but modeling systems in more of a generic sense? And we're still using that at SPC, and I included that in my last slide in terms of where do we see our products and services going to and what would the attributes be? And if you think that's still an appropriate way to operate, um, we'll continue to try and do that. Okay, as I wander my way up here, um, quick comment, okay, I'll, I'll come back. To you. Matt Perutka from MDL. It's interesting how this will build on to a number of the comments that we've been making. 
I'm suspicious that if I ask this room, raise your hand if you know what an NDFD is, National Digital Forecast Database, a lot of hands would go up. If I say the weather grid and the ugly strings that are inside of the weather grid, hands would start falling rapidly. And part of the problem that we have is not good ways of communicating our official products to the public. This is a quick shout out to a project that we've initiated as part of the SUDO conference that will be moving forward and it will be incredibly important. I consider it incredibly important because we're here, it's December, and we're inside the I-95 corridor. And how those ugly strings get defined in a weather grid needs to be, needs another dose of and that's what's going to happen. And it needs to turn into things like probability of freezing precipitation, probability of frozen precipitation, probability of varying levels, you know, amounts of QPF. Once those things get defined and get written down in language that looks like NW National Weather Service instructions, that leads us a target. It gives us a target. We now have targets for our statistical post processing. We have targets for our modeling output. So this happens to be one area where I commend to your attention because it's a place where the requirements process is probably going to move forward and give us something that we can shoot for. This is Eric Baylor speaking from Neza Star. Another area that needs to be re needs to remain in, a, in focus is at the NOAA level and how the requirements come in from outside the National Weather Service for other NOAA priorities like the Arctic, the ecological forecasting, uh, roadmap, et cetera. And that also leads to uh, requirements uh, for the integration and the modeling framework, uh, such things as what kind of nesting that will be done, um, the coupled modeling that needs to happen in order to support other aspects outside the Weather Service, but, but still within NOAA. I want to go back a little bit to sort of what Ken was yesterday and maybe I was the, the day before, is that I know we're talking, we, we, we tend to talk, we have acronyms for certain things in the future, we're talking about requirements, and I know I fall into the trap of when I think of requirements, I'm right away thinking about variables, parameters, you know, scales, time, and all that kind of stuff. And where, where Ken was, and actually Gene was saying it also, it, and, and uh, same thing with Bill, is the, the, we have a gap. We, we have a gap in our organization, and the gap in the organization is how do we do this? Not, not this. How does WFO so-and-so, how do they do this? I mean, Jeff was saying earlier is, okay, you don't even want to know how we do P-type. Okay, that's because it was generated at a time, I don't know if you have P-type yet in the forecast offices, but basically there was information that they, ha that they had and a couple of really creative, smart people managed to engineer an answer to fill a grid so that that could fill a, uh, a domain, basically. Okay, we've done a lot of that. Um, those of us through the oceans, we haven't come along with you, we're behind you. And... Now we have the problem of scale. We have limited resources like everybody. There isn't anybody in NOAA that speaks that doesn't have to quantify the fact that they have limited resources. All of us have limited resources. Okay? So that, but that's a key parameter. We saw that about computer resources and human resources this morning in several of the talks, data simulation. I, I really don't have an answer as to how we get from now to facets or whatever the answer. What's the in-between? and to do it so that we have a productive capability that our forecasters don't, don't start to get tunnel vision. I saw our forecasters during Joaquin because of the multiple threats, because of the limitations of trying to do grids, because of a track of a tropical cyclone, that no piece of guidance you could grab was a good starting point. And we had to live with that for four days with five days, of, of five days' worth of forecast changing every six hours. I just watched them go like this. You know, there's, there's an old story about fighter, fighter pilots back in the 70s when smart systems first came on board. And when it really, really mattered, guess what they turned off? All the peripherals. They were focusing stick, 
and where they were headed. That's what our forecasters were doing. I don't have a good answer for this, and I think of all the requirements that, that I have, that's probably the most critical is to define how we're going to get to the future with, with kind of what we have now. I don't really have any answer for it. Go ahead. So it's, it's an end-to-end. -end. How do we look at this holistically? Do the example that you gave about the rush hour. In reality, you need to be able to not only determine that information but communicate it to someone. So you tell, I guess, the SSD chief, and they say to the winter weather program, I need to be able to do this. And they go to what, AFS, and then AFS says, we need to be able to do this, and somebody decides, okay, well, we need these parameters, and they come to Hendrick. And, but also, even once Hendrick gets the information, then Becky's got to get it out to them. And, and yeah, I mean, it, that's, it's like... And, and the application, like, okay, you, you get this parameter, great, but then how does the forecaster use it? To, you know, it doesn't just magically work in GFE or something. So... So is it really, is it, are we talking about requirements for EMC or are we talking about requirements for the program? Okay, so, so you're going holistic, I get it. What we've been focusing on here is numerical guidance systems, right? I mean, that's what, that's what this conversation, at least in my interpretation, is. But that doesn't, well, it, but eventually the other side of it is, is the dissemination that the products are created by humans, okay? That's. And we're not talking about that part of the process, I don't think, in this room right now. Not that we have to, not should, that it should be ignored. No, but, but then you're going to, I understand. I mean, I understand where, where Mingus was saying both, and that's where I look at where it's both, is you can't let one go for the other. That, that, I mean, you can go, you can have a modeling system. I mean, unless the goal is basically so that the models basically produce forecasts eventually, you know, or with a certain time range. I don't think you can go too far Without, without being cognizant that it has to be able to be used, and that we do have a forecast process. Oh, I, oh, absolutely, no, no doubt. There we go. The alternative. Okay, here's here's kind of the situation. Um, we need a requirements process now. Whether we're talking about requirements in the field or requirements for EMC or wherever, but we need a requirements process process because here's what's happening. In the field, they know what their needs are and they, they can, one way or another, if their needs aren't being met, they'll gin up a solution. And we've seen this. Louis talks about, well, one time it's 17,000 apps, another time it's 22. It may be up to 99,000 by now. I don't know. But they, if their needs aren't being met, they'll find a way to, to do it because they're going to serve their customers. Uh, we're, we're very blessed in this organization and we have individuals that think that way, that they, they want to serve their customers. So what happens is there's this, let me take probabilities for, for an example. There's, um, they feel there's a need to convey uncertainty, so they're finding ways of doing that because that need isn't being met. Now, Steve says he's producing probabilities. I know WPC is producing probabilities. I think maybe MDL is. Uh, some of the, uh, you know, OPC, there's, uh, you know, some of, there's some hobby shopping going on in the forecast offices of them trying to pre create it because there, there hasn't been a process whereby these can be fed up efficiently and acted upon efficiently so that we're not talking two, three years turnaround. Now, if there's a science reason that's going to require a two or three year delay in getting something in place, fine, and you can you can convey that to the field and they'll understand that. And maybe we'll do something interim, maybe we won't, depending on if that makes sense. But the lack of a good process to get there get the needs expressed to the program managers, wherever it's supposed to go, has been missing. So therefore we have all these separate individual efforts. And that's not an efficient way to operate, you know? Not to take anything away from Steve or Dave Novak or anybody and creating the probabilities that they are, but it seems like if everybody's got this common need, there should be a way of addressing it in a unified fashion. Yeah, if, we make, if we make a vacuum, somebody will fill it. That's exactly what happens. Well, uh, it, to me, it's hard. I mean, I've only been coming to this meeting 10 years. It's hard to think that, it, it, that people don't know we have a requirement for 
uh, uncertainty probability information for determinate for uh, for DSS type stuff that is becoming more and more important. Uh, and you hear every region and every national center trying to provide uncertainty information. I'm not sure the science actually can support that. I mean, I, I don't. That's an open question to me. Uh, I'll just leave it out there. I mean, that seems to be a clear requirement. I just don't know the science will support that yet. Yeah, and, and requirements in general, yes, but the, the mapping to what we're doing is not always there. The example is uh, the fact that EMC was blindsided somewhat by the fact that uh, we didn't realize that SPC was used, had certain uses of the GEFS. And so, so we, we, even internally, yeah, I mean, we have, a, we have an idea of what you're doing, but we need to do a lot better job on, on just the internal mapping of what everybody's doing. So just real quick, and there's a question back there or a comment. All right, STI is having its planning meeting tomorrow in this room, and then a day and a half on Friday. And who from EMC is participating in that meeting? There's Ming, Ming had asked for some verification folks. So uh, Jeff's not available, but um, Glenn White and um, Feng Lin are going to be there. The, the thing is, they're going to be talking about the very topic we're talking about today in terms of whether the requirements for probabilistic <coughs> prediction. Facets is probabilistic in nature, and yet we're heading down that. That train's left the station. We're going. So what are we as an agency going to do to provide the foundational, you know, science underpinning for whatever, whatever is going to be required to feed that thing, right? It's going to be based on observations and numerical guidance systems in part, and then everything that goes on top of it. So that meeting tomorrow is a really important part of this process. And Ming, you know, STI... <laughs> you know, that's looking forward. $128 million a year. It's a big part of the Weather Service budget. How much? $134 million, even more. Um, uh, following on on that comment, um, NOAA's changing or upgrading its research to, tra to operations transition process. And as they, as under Dr. Spinrad, as NOAA's chief scientist, they are becoming much more formal in how uh, they do uh, the funding and transition of these research and development efforts into operations. And with that comes the fundamental necessity to have these research and development efforts tied to requirements because they're not going to be uh, going forth unless that can be expressed clearly within the transition plans that will be basically for everything that under the new research levels uh, five through eight, which are the predecessors of demonstration and into operations. And so documentation is fundamentally necessary. Otherwise, it's going to be harmful to the R&D enterprise supporting the uh, efforts of this production suite. Before we get to the end here, I guess there is one other question up here, and how should EMC prioritize? I mean, one of the things that we kind of heard this morning is, you know, it takes quite a while to get some things put in place. So I, I guess what I'm kind of curious about is once we do start identifying what requirements are, we understand how to get these pushed up to EMC, exactly where do we go from there, and how are they prioritized in, in a timely fashion? The key thing here is that, you know, it's not just EMC anymore. NOS has requirements. Uh, OER is a big part of the model development scene today. Nessus has a role with the, the data simulation observations. ARL, for example. So, you know, it's in this. That was the whole point of the UMAC. The UMAC was not focused on NSEP. It was focused holistically across the operational production suite. And you know, NCO owns it in the end. They got to operate it, but um, it's it's more than just NSEP these days. So. You know, we've, we've got to look at this from a holistic viewpoint and, and not focus on so much of the ownership. If the process within the weather service works, it should inform what OAR is, is working on, whether it's in modeling, whether it's in observation systems, you know, whatever it might be, it informs ARL. And if we do this in a successful way that really fosters communication documentation, then we help avoid what I've seen in the past of redundancy in terms of people developing the same solution for the same problem without communicating with each other. 
And so I think, you know, we, we've touched on it in this meeting, con communication, communication, communication. And it goes to, I think, every point that people made in this, this discussion right now, in that requirements process, once we get it right, and it's going to take a little bit of time, but once we get it right, it's going to foster that communication and documentation. So we know where to go to get that information, and we're all communicating about the same things. So it's not just the weather service thing. You know, the requirements would then be once, once validated within weather service, then they would be shared with all the other line offices. And we would, you know, work together with the other line offices to help develop solutions for those requirements because weather service can't do it alone, right? So, um, Bill, I might add, um, and I think uh, the UMAC uh, was addressing this as well, all our other kinds of partners. I mean, we partner with NASA, we partner with ON, um, ONR, we partner with uh, all the university systems and so on under no NSF-funded programs, et cetera, et cetera. So it expands out from there, and all those cooperating agencies and so on, and, and, and WMO programs, et cetera, they all kind of feed in, and we see what we can you know, use to satisfy our requirements. And we, and we mentioned that a few times already in, in, in different discussions and presentations, that the fact that for the, for the first time that I've seen at the, the Louis and Craig McLean level, there's a real drive to get uh, OAR and the weather service properly aligned. Uh, the, the benefits of that are just astronomical. Uh, potential benefits not only, but we're already seeing that. We're already seeing uh, also, for instance, between uh, CPO and uh, EMC. <laughs> Uh, EMC is part of the CPO process to do directed research to assure that the directed research funded by CPO has a path to operation that's relevant for us. And that's just another step, but we need to get that all the way through everywhere. And we discussed about that yesterday, too. The, it is not the, the agenda is outdated with that statement, just from the discussions we've had before. And uh, there, are, there is a key, though. Some of the things we'll need to prioritize where we put our resources on, but we also have to have to learn how to work with the different councils and figure out at which level which decision is made. And, and, and you can look at that, oh, we haven't done that yet, but I'm looking at that as with the new structure of the weather service as an opportunity to do this the right way, but we have to learn how to do this. So. Uh, Bill and everybody, <coughs> uh, yesterday I suggested uh, about a document, and may I ask, is it naive or impatient even though we have all these processes that are getting ready to get going to start, and let me suggest maybe through uh, regions right now, out of the people in this room, to start a document. Uh, and, and just what are the things that we think are sort of our uh, requirements right now as best we can? And, and actually, just actually having something tangible outcome from this meeting, just to get something going out of that. Yes, it would have to go through these other processes, and maybe we could even you know, bounce off to, you know, between each other, you know, what constitutes a requirement? Are we, are we saying the right thing? Are we kind of prescribing too much of the solution? But we could iterate among ourselves in this room. What do you think? They kicked it off. I think that'd be a great idea. You're not going to know until you start kicking it around. And, um, um, Yeah, right. That, that's a start to that. And, that's 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 step one. Um, the other part, of, the other part of that was the 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 slides that I pulled out uh, in in my presentation is a a, um, a a part of a much bigger slide set that I'm building, trying trying to do exactly the same thing. What we need to coordinate is two different things: uh, a, a write-up of how we define, uh, in my perspective, a write-up of how we define uh, requirements in general, but also just document how everybody is using the different uh, scales and what their needs are in terms of, uh, of uh, parameters coming out, et cetera. I've got to run out, but one last thing about the requirements process. Weather Service has a governance document. How many of you have seen it? Okay. We're going to revise it, and we're going to sign it again in April. It's a living document, and that's where the requirements process is going to get documented. So you have an opportunity to have a say in that. You should be working with your regional directors, the MSDs. Everybody should be working on that to get it to a place that's going to serve you. So I know it's bureaucratic and everything like that, but we're living by it, and we're going to be held accountable to it. So it's an opportunity to get involved and provide your input to that process.
it's open to everybody. Okay. Um, actually, this discussion, I'm going to let uh, Dave say one more thing. About, I was going to say that after lunch we have a general open discussion which kind of addresses everything we've talked about at the meeting. So we'll have uh, plenty of opportunity to do this uh, after lunch, but we'll close with uh, what Dave has to say. Yeah, um, with Nestus, Tipio, staffing, observing system council with, with Aaron uh, Pratt. Um, <clears throat> we're working with CFO and Mark Benson. Uh, and uh, Mark Seiler is extremely frustrated with performance measures as stated in NOAA. Uh, and so I would encourage the group here to not only think about outcomes in terms of requirements your customer needs, but also performance measures and how we might want to take the opportunity to rethink. Uh, and Mark Seiler's bitch is that, you know, we don't know the difference between outputs, which I think uh, Bill Lapinta's kvetch, versus outcomes, which is what our customers want. Uh, so not the widgets, but how do we influence the decision-making process? So how do we not only establish requirements, how do we measure uh, progress to plan, you know, the, the actual logic model. Um, and so we're working with them. We're going to look at, uh, with uh, Mark Vincent per uh, Mark Seiler, we're going to look at all that. But this is going on in parallel to everything you're doing. But it's, 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 we all have to meet <laughs> at the same place at some time because this is how we get our money. If we can't say to Congress that uh, we're performing at, for the money they give us for the $5 billion or whatever it is, the money they give us that we're not doing our job for the public, then we're not going to get money. Uh, and we've got to tell that story. So that's it. Okay, thank you. So I guess we'll break for lunch, come back, and continue this type and more general discussion at 1. So thank you. <laughs>